Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Disrupting the Landscape, how a $12 billion plus multifamily office is making waves amongst advisors and their clients. It's a conversation with Avi Stein, founder and co-chairman of Crescent. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. For Apple Podcast users, I'd be grateful if you'd give the show a review. Your input helps us to make the series better and alerts other advisors like you who may find the content to be relevant. And while you're at it, if you know others who are considering change or are simply looking to learn more about the industry landscape, please feel free to share this episode or the series widely. Advisors and clients have been the beneficiaries of a more than decade-long evolution of the industry. Changes that have led to opening the eyes and minds of advisors, awakening them to the fact that the status quo need not be something they settle for. And for their high net worth clients, they too have recognized that wanting more from their advisors and the firms they work for is a right they've earned. As such, new models have emerged that are taking the best from all others and delivering options that are more flexible and client service driven topped off with the ability for advisors to take greater agency and control over the businesses they are building. It was a vision that came to Avi Stein and partner Eric Becker, who has family office clients, found themselves exploring options and were struck by the limitations of existing wealth management approaches, including sophisticated advice and access to an ecosystem of direct private investments. So as business investors and innovators, Avi and Eric set out to build a better mousetrap, a model that checked off all the boxes that they saw were missing or not up to the standards that a high net worth client wanted and deserved. And so in 2017, Crescent was born. It's an employee and client owned multifamily office designed to deliver a new paradigm for wealth management with rockstar leadership and advisor talent and a value proposition that's resonating with the wealth management world. For example, in 2020, Crescent made headlines with their acquisition of $2.3 billion RIA Pagnato Carp, the firm that Merrill Breakaway's Paul Pagnato and David Carp first launched with Hightower in 2011 and then made another break for full-on independence in 2016. Plus, Crescent has had unprecedented success in recruiting private bankers and high net worth focus advisors from throughout the industry landscape. So I'm thrilled to have Avi on this episode to tell us about Crescent's journey, to talk about what it takes to build what they describe as a better model for advisors and clients, how they compare to firms like Rockefeller, what's driving interest amongst advisors, and so much more. Let's get to it. I can't thank you enough for making the time to join me today. Thank you, Mindy. I can't thank you enough for having me and congratulations on the incredible work that you and Lewis and your team do for advisors. Thank you. All right. Lots to cover. So let's jump in. You come to the wealth management space as a high net worth client turned business owner. Tell us a little bit about your background and that of your partner and co-chairman, Eric Becker, if you would. Sure. Sure. So Eric and I both are entrepreneurs and private equity investors. Eric and I both have built, uh, well, in in the aggregate, we've built about 150 companies over our lifetime, investing over $8 billion of equity capital and don't even want to say how much debt capital on top of that, building uh, several businesses. We were both family office clients. Eric had his own multifamily office with some other folks. And I was a client both of uh, bulge bracket firms and of family offices. We were investing our own family capital together, buying companies and doing real estate transactions. When we decided that we were very unhappy with what was available to us in terms of multifamily office services, 
and decided we would do some research with a research firm on what might be possible, what were the trends in the industry, and what we thought would be an interesting investment proposition, which is how we got started in Crescent. So what specifically was missing? What were you looking to solve for? Mainly, we were looking to solve for something that had four components. First, you know, an, an uncompromised uh, investment infrastructure led by macro strategies, uh, what we call efficient beta. We didn't really believe that there was a lot of beating the market. We weren't looking for beta in the public markets, but a very strong macro strategy, goals-based planning and investing, manager selection, deep infrastructure and research. Coupled with broad and deep family office services, everything from family governance and education down to you know healthcare advocacy, uh, wealth strategy, wealth planning, uh, financial planning, tax compliance, tax strategies, and everything else that a multi-billion dollar, multi-generational family might have, whether it was help in buying houses or buying cars or buying jets, all of those kinds of things. Then true expertise throughout the private investment landscape. So uh, developing a detailed private equity team, a detailed private equity secondaries team, a very deep real estate team. We have about a 20 person real estate team and being able also to be very good at credit. So we felt like you needed to have a true institutional quality private investment infrastructure being the third leg to the stool. And then the fourth piece was building an ecosystem, uh, peer to peer learning, lots of events, lots of strategies for people to really enjoy the value of what they've created. So what you're saying is you were high net worth clients. You looked out across the wealth management space, both in the RIA space as well as in the traditional bulge bracket space. You didn't find what you were looking for. So you and Eric set out to build it. Is that accurate? That is 100% correct. And just one other thing I would say about that is you know, if you looked at the bulge bracket space, there's some very great people in there and there are a lot of things that are done well. Full alignment with the clients wasn't necessarily something that, that we experienced in that space. And then when you looked at the RIA space, it was very fragmented, not a lot of scale. So you might have some very good alignment, but you wouldn't necessarily have all of the optionality that you might have gotten on the other side. So we thought we can combine all of that and create both in one, in one entity. So a lot to unpack there, but let me ask you then, first and foremost, so what is Cresset's value proposition? Cresset is what? Cresset is a multifamily office, which, as I mentioned, has, has four really significant pieces to it. As I said before, a, a deep investment infrastructure, broad and deep family office services, and it has uh, the, I think, the only among RIAs, you know, fully functioning private investment strategy that uh, goes across private equity, private equity secondaries, real estate and credit. And it has a big ecosystem with peer to peer learning, lots of events and a commitment to creating community. OK, so. You mentioned before that when you looked at the bulge bracket space, the wirehouse world, you saw a lack of full alignment. What does that mean exactly? Right. So if you think about what's happened recently, there's been a 12% share shift over the last decade away from uh, banks and wirehouses to independent firms. And the proposition of the independent firms has been very simple. We get paid once. We get paid one fee and we are completely indifferent as to what you, the client, invests in, because it doesn't affect our compensation. So we only choose the best things for you because nobody gets paid to sell you anything. We don't get paid to sell you a private deal. We don't get paid to sell you a house fund. We don't get paid to sell you anything. So we can be fully your advocate. And then added to that has been, we'll help with your estate plan or your tax or uh, finding somebody to, to run your house or whatever else you might need. In the bulge bracket, obviously there are a lot of house products. There is a presumption that you'll use the banking services. You're only allowed in many of those places to use what the bank has to offer for lending products, lending vehicles. We always say we're not one bank, we're every bank. So it's a very significant difference in the approach. So 
I know you've had a lot of success in the past three plus years since your launch. So let's first start out. Tell us a little bit about the success, where you've recruited folks from, how you've grown organically, and why you think it's resonating so much in the marketplace. Sure. So on our ADV, we're about $14 billion, uh, or would be if we filed an ADV today. And then there's about another 3 to $4 billion that are assets that we advise on. And that's been done in about a little over three years. It'll be four years next October since we took our first money. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we've invested over $130 million in our platform. Uh, We built the platform first. The idea was to build the platform, build the brand. We invested in marketing. We invested in platform. We invested in digital strategies. We invested in uh, creating a deep private equity team, a deep real estate team, a deep private equity secondaries team. It's actually a 40 act fund, credit partnerships with top credit uh, funds in the country. And so all of that is resonating out of the $14 billion roughly of, of actual AUM, only $3 billion has been purchased. The rest has been bringing in private bankers, some bulge bracket uh, warehouse folks as well, and using our networks and building our networks and working very hard on the marketing and the brand. Yeah, well, that's extraordinary. So one of the things I think I want to ask you about is when I think of Crescent, I tend to describe the industry landscape in buckets, if you will. And when I think of Crescent, I think of Crescent in the same bucket that I would put Rockefeller. And Rockefeller is also crushing it, having enormous success for a lot of the same reasons that Crescent is resonating, except Rockefeller has a name that is easier to explain, that advisors find it easier to embrace because it's a well-known name synonymous with ultra high net worth clients. So help us to understand, if you would, how Rockefeller, how and where Rockefeller and Crescent are similar and how they're different. Sure. There is, I think, a substantial movement toward the independent space. And if you think about where this is going, if we have this conversation a decade from now, Mindy, my guess is there will be half a dozen or so private firms, independent firms that have you know, $100 billion or more of AUM. And I th- certainly think Rockefeller will likely be one of them. And I, I, I hope that we will also be one of them. The similarities are that we're independent firms and we're growing fast. The differences, I think, are significant as well in that Rockefeller has more of a look to it like an old wirehouse, less of a look to it like something that's, you know, that's very different. Yet, you know, that's great firm, nothing, nothing negative about Rockefeller. We're very different in that, you know, that our clients that are family office clients, they're getting a, a significant bundle of service. Uh, if you look at our ADV and their ADV, we only charge one fee. They still do get get paid commissions and some other things. And that can be good or bad, depending on, on what people's proclivities are. Ours is very focused on private alpha. And if you think about the way private investing was always done when I had my private equity firm, JP Morgan or someone else would be an investor of ours. They would pay people to sell investments in our funds. So, so, so someone would be paying you know, 2% fee, 20% carried interest, and then they'd pay an additional fee and potentially an additional carried interest, depending on whether it was JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley or wherever our partner was. Uh, very different uh, what we do. We do direct investing in family companies. We do joint ventures with the Marriott family buying hotels. We do joint ventures uh, with asset management firms and asset management acquirers where the fee might be totally one in 15 or something like that. So it's lower fee. Uh, We do a number of things where our clients uh, do joint ventures uh, in the credit space where they actually get a piece of the general partnership not just the limited partnership. Same thing when we will do a family uh, investment with one of our family uh, companies where we're doing a recapitalization. We structure things uh, differently. We structure things largely with very significant yield, downside protection, and upside participation and low leverage. Whereas 
in general, firms like Rockefeller are investing in funds or fund of funds, which you know is very different from what we do. You know, I think we really focus a lot on our digital marketing, our strategies. Our organic growth is where we focus very hard. We do like to bring in strategically terrific people, people who are aligned with us, who want to have multiple ways to win. When we bring in an advisor, they're owning a lot of stock in Crescent. Our first movers who came in, their stock is probably worth about four times what it was when they first came in. So we're offering multiple ways to win. Rockefeller is more of a, a traditional deal. And again, you know, both appeal to different people and nothing wrong or right with either. And we also are very big on building our ecosystem. You know, one thing I always mention to people thinking about coming over is we have over 300 investors in our private investment vehicles who are not on platform that are prospects for all of our advisors. We spend an enormous amount of money building a non-traditional marketing group that is you know, obviously growing very fast. We've, we've uh, onboarded over 100 clients organically, not by bringing new advisors on, but organically from existing advisors year to date this year approaching $2 billion of new assets. Yeah, okay. So amazing success. And what I want to say is that, in my view, the reason I say that firms like Rockefeller and Crescent sort of fall into the same bucket is because they appeal to the same kind of advisor, the private banker or bulge bracket or wirehouse advisor that is running a great business, a growing, likely ultra high net worth or high net worth focused business doing multi millions in production, you know, managing multi billions in assets, who is looking for more freedom and control and has likely looked at the independent space and felt that it was a bridge too far to build their own and didn't want to go out and help to pull together all of the support and resources and infrastructure that you did and like the idea of joining an, a firm on an RIA chassis that offers them more freedom and control, but not the heavy lift of building something from scratch. So in your opinion, why do you think that is resonating so much, not only with advisors, but with end clients? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, whether it's Rockefeller or Crescent, or there are a couple other names uh, you could throw in there, I think the independent space is resonating. I think that you know Fidelity, Schwab, and others are spending many, many tens of millions of dollars to make that point. And I think that you know if you just look at the evolution of where things have gone, I don't want to get too far off track here, but I always say Elliot Spitzer had a little bit to do with this. You know, if you go way back in time, when you separated sales and trading from research, a lot of independent research firms grew up. Therefore, independent firms could buy the same information that basically the, the, the bulge brackets and the banks were getting. So that had a lot to do with the proliferation of these independent firms. Now that there are so many and that the marketing has changed from all having to spend a lot of money on television building a brand to digital and other means, it levels the playing field. There's been a true democratization of information and a leveling of the playing field. And I think the consumer, especially the sophisticated consumer, especially the younger consumer, owner, operator of a business, tech executive, understands that they want alignment of interest, they want independence, they want uniqueness, they want differentiation, and they realize that the, the playing field has been leveled and the independents can absolutely compete and do a great job for them. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree with you more. I think those are very much the reasons why advisors are looking to move toward versions of greater independence. So let's focus a little bit for now on the advisor talent you've brought over. You mentioned that 14 billion under management in three years, which is extraordinary, and only 3 billion has been purchased. So maybe tell us a little bit about the 3 billion that was purchased and mm -hmm. a little bit about the private banking talent and wirehouse advisor talent you've recruited. Sure. So the three billion that's been purchased was three acquisitions. One was a small firm in San Francisco called Cypress, about four hundred million dollars of AUM, I think, at the time. Uh, one was a small firm in Chicago called Evanston, similar size, and the other was a, a slightly larger firm uh, called Pagnano Carp, about two billion at the time we bought it, which was based in Reston, Virginia. Uh, Pagnano Carp uh, was about. 15 million ish when we bought it. I think it's 20, maybe approaching 20 million in that office today in Reston, Virginia, and it's nine months later. So, and that's annual revenue, correct? 
annual revenue. And Pagnotto Corp, for just for clarity, is of Hightower fame, correct? Yeah, Paul Pagnotto, David Carp uh, were Merrill advisors. They went to Hightower. They left Hightower and started their own firm. They built it to about $2 billion and then decided to partner with us. So that's all the acquisitions. And then in terms of the folks that we've recruited, I'd say it's been a preponderance of private bankers with more recently a a gentleman from Goldman Sachs, and we have done a couple of other lift outs. But it's people who recognize a couple of things. One, they are wanting to build a great business and they want all the support possible they can have to build that business. Marketing support, family office service support, private investment support, and, and an ecosystem. It's people who recognize that while the selling of their business from time to time may very well be great, there's also another opportunity, which is to get equity interest in something that's growing very, very fast. And that, you know, usually large pools of, of cash flow trade at higher multiples and small pools of cash flow. So the opportunity that they can can leverage off of what we're doing is very important to them. I think about, you know, the old partnerships like the old Alex Brown or the old Goldman Sachs pre-IPO. That's what we're building. We're building something where people will earn dividends annually over time. They will also own, earn great interests in the business over time. And when they retire, get paid out on those interests. So it's a different model, a very different model. I want to just ask you a question. You mentioned equity. It's so interesting because Before a decade ago or so, advisors were really negative about equity. Recruiting deals had historically been paid part cash and part equity. And in the financial crisis, when all of that equity was worth nothing, and they realized that they left a whole lot on the table, advisors were loath to take equity as part of a recruiting deal. But in the last decade or so, the RIA space and firms in it, like Crescent, have really proven that equity can be incredibly valuable. And, you know, what you said, analogizing it to the old partnerships of firms like Alex Brown or Goldman Sachs pre-IPO is exactly right. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you structure deals, the part cash and part equity, and how these advisors or bankers coming on are feeling about cash versus equity in the incentive form? Sure. So first of all, let me just go back one step. A lot of the failures of the firms where equity was a big deal, or at least the more public and known ones, had to do a lot with the structure. Where they were giving equity, but they were giving equity in a pool that was consistently being diluted by additional people coming on, only diluting that pool. In other words, they weren't aligning the advisor equity with the owner equity. That's not what we do. So we only bring on advisors and give them equity if we think it's accretive to the whole business. So each time a new advisor comes on, Our business grows. There is dilution of everybody pro rata, but hopefully the dilution is less than the accretion that we will get from having brought on those great people. They're going to help to propel the business forward. So we're very, very careful and selective, obviously, about who we bring on. The equity value is a really interesting thing. It's we're in the third inning of Crescent, maybe, maybe the second inning. Obviously, not even four years old. We're we're a new business, and our view is that that equity will continue to double every few years. And as a result, uh, advisors have a a really good opportunity and feel really good about it. I will tell you the best evidence I have of it is uh, we have two things going on right now. One is that we have a number of our advisors who have asked if their compensation can be in net profits interests or equity as compared to cash. In other words, they want to take a higher percentage of their compensation and equity. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's pretty much unheard of. <laughs> Keep going. Well, it's, it's, it's incredible. Of course, yeah. <laughs> you know, we say yes. And, and every year we do compensate, you know, if there's, if there's bonuses for our people who are not the advisors, we give them a portion of, of cash and stock, but the advisors themselves are asking to take some percentage of their compensation uh, in equity uh, versus cash. The second thing is that for the last several months, we have been working legally to figure out how 
uh, non-qualified investors, certain of our advisors and other folks can invest directly in our private investment opportunities. And uh, we finally figured that one out. And, and, you know, it's been much more demand there than I thought there would be. So, so the folks that are working for us are understanding how this is working uh, and they're very excited to be part of it. Yeah. Well, I think that that's, you know, I talk a lot about a, a real shift in advisor mindset in the last decade or so. And when I started the business almost 25 years ago, cash was king and it was all there was. And I think today when a firm can make the case, can be transparent about what the equity can be worth, how the firm is valued, what they see as the end game and ways for the advisor to monetize the equity, advisors are pretty excited about it. And then the calculus is, do I want to bet on building my own equity or do I believe that to be part of the whole of what you're building will ultimately be more valuable? So I say, why not bet on both? You asked about structure. It can be 75, 25, it can be 70, 30, it can be 60, 40, it can be 50, 50 with the first component being cash. So if somebody says, you know, my business has this value, uh, you're going to buy my business. Uh, I want 70% or 75% cash. I'm willing to do that. I don't necessarily think that's the best thing for them. And I think they'll probably wish they had taken more equity, but certainly happy to do that. So I think it's great because they get the opportunity to monetize a portion in cash and have two bets going. And I always tell the story of when I was in the private equity business, I had a very good friend who was a private equity senior person at a bulge bracket firm that had a private equity group. He decided to leave, go off on his own. I was very excited for him. And then he told me that he was partnering with a boutique investment banking firm, and he was going to give up half of the carried interest that he was getting on his private equity side, but getting some stock in that firm. And I thought, gee, that's kind of curious because this guy was a can't miss guy. He was going to make a lot of money in the private equity business. And in the end, it was very interesting. He made a lot more money on what he got in stock from the firm than he necessarily did on his carried interest. And it really opened my eyes to this multiple ways to win philosophy and the idea that it just just makes a whole lot of sense. And then if you add to that, that our people get a chance to invest in some very unique investment opportunities along the way, it adds a third way for them to win. And I think that's resonating. Yeah. So how are the advisors and bankers that you've hired over the last three and a half years, how are they doing now? How much have they grown under the Crescent umbrella? And what do you think is driving that? Maybe you can give us some specific examples. Yeah, sure. So I saw in one of the sheets today that UBS was bringing on another group of private bankers. And I think the line was they think that they're going to bring 25 uh, percent of their clients and 50 percent of their revenues. I'm not really sure how that math works to begin with. But the 25 percent number is pretty aspirational. Generally, obviously, they're always outliers. But when private bankers come over, the history is 12 to 25 percent for better private bankers generally what they'll bring over over two or three years. So it's not a great growth curve. Yet, because of our brand and because of what we've done, every one of the private bankers that we brought over who needed to get to a crossover point where 40% of their revenues would cover their salaries has gotten there and gotten there sometimes two to one or three to one. So most of the early movers who have been with us two years or more are well over three and a half, four million dollar practices. So they've grown, and as everybody recognizes, there's the garden leave and, and you know the little bit of a, a difficult start for them. So it doesn't happen immediately; it happens over time. So I think that's a tribute to who they are, but also a tribute to who are they, who they are, coupled with the brand. And then the businesses we bought have grown dramatically. I mentioned Pagnato Carp is the best example. It's it's grown over thirty percent in the last nine months. And I know one of the things you've done is really doubled down and invested in building an extraordinarily robust infrastructure with real rock star leadership talent. And I imagine it's part of that, that that support that drives some of the growth that the advisors you've recruited have experienced. So what can you tell us about those folks you've hired and why it matters? I think it's critical to hire people that you know, know how to bring in business. And there's advisors are, are a continuum. There are those advisors that are fabulous new business people and fabulous 
uh, with clients in servicing clients. There are those that are one or the other, and there are those that are somewhere in the middle, and it's a continuum. If you can add to that mix the ability to create a tremendous volume of leads, uh, both through uh, people like Pat Canning, who we brought in. Pat was the lead director of KPMG. He was head of their Chicago office. Prior to that, he was head of their Boston office. He just has such an incredible bevy of contacts. And if you give him the right platform and you team him with the right advisors, you know, there's just no limit to what he can do. And that's, you know, more of an old school way of doing it. And then on the digital marketing side, we've spent years perfecting what we do digitally and are willing to spend quite a bit of money doing that. And that yields you know, tremendous lead flow and faster closing lead flow, which is kind of interesting. When people come digitally to you, they've already researched and they know that you have something they want and they have a need. So it's, it's very interesting. That's a lot harder than the many pitches that, that you might make to ask somebody to come from one investment advisor to another. And what is the average client size or median client size of these clients that are coming in via digital marketing efforts? About $22 million is the average, but it's interesting. We have several hundred plus million clients. Wow. Uh, and we have smaller. As you see, what's really interesting about it is we were not executing on the smaller leads. And we have a brilliant young man who was actually Eric's chief of staff at the time, who was very involved in this marketing. He said, we should take a look at who are these people? And what was really interesting is we found a lot of them were, were founders of businesses. And though they didn't have a lot of liquidity, they had tremendous upside in their equity values. So we created a way to service them as well, which we, we internally call Crescent Catalyst. But there's you know, 10x their value of the equity they hold in their businesses to their liquidity. Yeah. And you're saying then that these referrals or leads that come in via digital marketing get distributed amongst your advisor talent. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's another good reason to, uh, it's another way to win, to quote you. It is another way to win. Yeah. yeah. We are very committed to helping our advisors grow the business. And, you know, again, uh, there's one key differentiator here when you give a substantial portion of equity to people coming in. And that is everybody knows that they win when we win and we win when they win. So it's unlike what exists in a bulge bracket firm where everybody's kind of on their own. You know, I saw something you, you asked about Rockefeller earlier. One difference, and you know, again, there's no right and wrong here, but one difference is someone joined Rockefeller and they said they're going to be the so-and-so team at Rockefeller. There's no so-and-so team at Crescent. There's just Crescent. And everybody benefits from the halo. Everybody benefits from Jack Ablin on CNBC three times a week. Everybody benefits from our interviewing Mark Cuban and our interviewing the former CEO of McDonald's and Gretchen Carlson and a whole lot of other people. Well, last week we did Walter Isaacson. We're interviewing Matthew McConaughey. I mean, we're doing all these events where clients come. We had a cryptocurrency event where we had 450 people sign up to come and listen to a gentleman who had made a lot of money in cryptocurrency speak about what there was to do there and where blockchain is going. These events bring in clients and prospects, and then we distribute them, obviously, to our advisors. And everybody is working together, realizing that because they own stock, if the person next to them does well, their stock's going to be worth more money. So it's a very different mentality. All right. So as Crescent continues to grow, what does your ideal advisor or private banking prospect look like? And I'm talking both in what geographic markets and I'm talking in terms of the where the advisors are coming from and what kind of business they're running. Growth markets in general. The markets that we're in are San Francisco, a little bit in Seattle, Denver. We are in Minneapolis, Chicago, West Palm Beach, Atlanta, Houston, and DC area. Where we want to be, in addition to those, is more in Texas, Austin, Dallas. We want to be in Southern California. We will probably do more in the Pacific Northwest, probably Nashville, maybe the Carolinas. We'll see. That's not our highest and best use. And the Northeast is, is not highest on our list, but at some point we will be in the, in the Northeast. Yeah. Well, New York seems to be an obvious omission. That's curious to me. Is that by design? Yes. Interesting. Very competitive. Only want to go into New York in a significant way. 
you know, so we started an office in Houston two months ago. It'll be about a billion dollars with one small acquisition we're about to accomplish. And the gentleman team we brought out of Goldman Sachs, it's going to be great. Uh, it'll be about a billion dollars in let's call it four or five months. You can't go into New York that way, in my view. It's just it's just too hard. We believe that it would have to be something more significant, a very large team or a significant RAA. Got it. Okay. All right. Tell us a little bit then about the target advisor. Sure. So the target advisor is growth mindset, growth oriented, someone who really sees the value of being fully aligned with the clients, someone who wants to be part of something wants to be a great partner, someone who wants to service clients that can benefit from private investments, family office services, ecosystem. That doesn't mean that they all have to be 50 or $100 million clients. There are many $10 million clients that benefit from the ecosystem and benefit from private investment vehicles. Like, for example, we have a 40-act private equity or secondaries business that's a $200,000 minimum, and it has quarterly liquidity. It's broad-based exposure to private equity generally without a J-curve. It's performing unbelievably 23% last year. And it's just a fabulous vehicle for people to get on trade of the private markets, which we are committed to believing is where the alpha is. So they don't have to be a huge client to be able to benefit from that. So it's not all very large clients. But what it is, is people who are committed to growing the business, being aligned with their clients, being accountable, and wanting to be part of something rather than just have their own business. And how about how much revenue you'd ideally like them to be generating annually and assets to be managed? Sure. So we're willing for the right person to do things that are slightly different from this. But in general, we're looking for people who come in with at least you know half a million dollars in revenue. But not only, we are willing to look beyond that if it's the right fit and somebody we can help to develop. And obviously, we're very excited when people come to us with 5 or $10 million of revenue. I know from what I know of the firm that I don't see you opening in Nashville, Tennessee, one of the markets you mentioned, for half a million dollars in revenue. No, 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 no. no. To open, right? they would, it would have to be a billion or more. Right. That's what I would think. Okay. Got it. So let's zoom out a little bit. And I want help me to understand, like you mentioned family office services. And if you're an advisor, if you're part of the private wealth unit at Morgan Stanley or UBS or part of PBIG at Merrill, you believe you have access to family office services. And I think that the term means different things in the wirehouse world than it means in the RIA space. So tell me what that means to you specifically and how it differs from the access and advisors gets to family office services in the traditional space. Sure. So at Crescent, if you're a family office client, when you come in, you are assigned not only an advisor, but a financial planner, a wealth strategist, which is a former practicing attorney who's doing your estate uh, planning. If you're interested, a tax specialist who will not only do tax planning for you, but can do tax preparation for you. You're assigned someone from the concierge team who will help you with healthcare advocacy, cybersecurity protection, pretty much any household or or large ticket purchase item that you might need. If you're interested, you will meet with our family governance specialists. They'll do family meetings for you. They'll do family planning, mission, vision, and values. If you want your kids to go to our camp where we teach them how to do business plans, what it's like to be children of a wealthy family, how to do philanthropy, you can do that too. We have a philanthropic consultant that you can also meet with who's on the team, who will be part of your team if that's of interest to you. In addition to all that, We'll organize your your financial life fully. We'll set up everything for you. Think about it as an outsourced CFO kind of service so that, you know, we can do all your bill payment. We can do your make sure your financial statements are right. We don't do the bookkeeping, but we can find and hire and supervise those things for you. So you're enveloped by everything that you might want or need. You can basically say, do it all for me, or I would like these services, but not these services. And, and it's the client's choice. That's not what happens at, at a large bulge bracket. You might have somebody fly in from time to time and, and give some estate planning advice. Financial planning may or may not be part of what's happening. The concierge stuff is usually not what's happening. And they probably, or some might have, the outsourced CFO services would be a very separate charge and a separate arrangement. This is all part of what we do for our clients. 
Yeah. And what you're saying is this part ties back to what we said at the beginning, that you were that high net worth client who had been a client of the bulge bracket world and found that what they offered wasn't exactly what you were looking for. Is that accurate? Correct. Correct. I mean, I, I think there are many models and different clients are going to want different things and just different advisors are going to want different things. So by no means am I casting aspersions on any of these things, but my experiences were uh, it was a little holy water kind of sprinkling from somebody who was very smart, but it wasn't part of the team. It wasn't part of the follow through. It wasn't part of the day to day interaction. It wasn't putting everything in one place. Got it. And, you know, it's so interesting because, first of all, you're 100 percent right that a conversation like this talking about the benefits or the value proposition of Cresset is not to say that an advisor who practices at Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley is bad or isn't servicing their clients well. But it is to say that the industry landscape has expanded that advisor mindset has shifted and that a clients want something different. And where and when an advisor and or a client wants something different, it is refreshing to know that the waterfall of possibilities has expanded and models like Crescent exist, which didn't exist years ago. Right, right. Absolutely. There's no one model, that's for sure. Yeah. But I want to go back for a second to the notion of brand name. Because I cannot tell you how many times I talk to an advisor at in the bulge bracket space that runs a spectacular business that who wouldn't be intrigued by what you're talking about? The notion of perhaps a more nimble or more refreshing culture, the notion of equity as part of the equation, the notion of growth being supported by through these digital marketing efforts, the notion of access to private investments and et cetera, et cetera. But A lot of these folks have grown up drinking the Kool-Aid, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but really believing that everything they have is more than good enough and believing that their fill in the blank, their ultra high net worth client, their international client, their institutional client, I can go on and on, their female client, whatever it is, will have a problem separating from a brand name. They believe that it is the name of Wells Fargo or Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs or Rockefeller or whatever it is that is a big contributor to their success. And then along comes a firm named Crescent, which no one's heard of or virtually no one's heard of, that has a very interesting value proposition, but certainly begs the question, how do I reconcile giving up a recognizable brand name and a firm that's mature, that's been around for a long time, not just three or four years? How do I make that shift? Sure. So I think think there's a couple things in that question that are are very interesting. One is, just look at the numbers, 12% over the last decade are making that shift in terms of the share of market that's owned by the independent space versus the bulge bracket space. I view what UBS is doing right now, uh, trying to treat private bankers like they have a book of business to transfer as just a sign of how difficult it is for these firms to grow, because that from an economic perspective is, is very difficult to understand. So I think a lot's going on and it's already happening, the shift away from these types of names, both bracket types of names to independent names. And I think there are you know, a number of reasons for it that we've already talked about. But I'm just going to give you one very quick example of how it goes. We have a very large client who called one day and said, I am very excited when somebody who I have money with, and this gentleman has money with a few different people, tells me they're going to a private firm. And when they tell me they're going from one bulge bracket to another, I ask them what percentage I am of their revenue and how much of the check I'm getting. (laughs) Because he said, sophisticated clients understand what's going on. And when someone says, someone who's built a business and is an entrepreneur says, you know, I understand you are going to a place where you're going to be an owner, where you're going to be an entrepreneur, where you are fully aligned with me. And where you are going to offer me something different than what I can get where I am today. I understand that. If you tell me you're going to the same kind of place, just moving, changing jerseys, that's more difficult. So I think that has a lot to do with it as well. And I think it's going to continue. And, you know, I mean, you know, Fidelity and Schwab and Pershing and newer custodians that are coming on, they're pushing this agenda and they're pushing it very, very hard. Disruption in banking 
is also going to change things. You know, when you start thinking about all of the the just look at the margins of the bulge brackets. They make, you know, teens kind of margins, including spread revenue on income. Well, if that starts to come away, now what happens? So there's going to be a lot of pressure. And I do think a, a much larger share of this business is going to end up in the independent space. And I think that the consumer recognizes other brands. And again, with I grew up in the grocery business. We owned a couple hundred grocery stores. Not even grow up in it, but I, as a private equity investor, grew up in it. And I remember when I started, we had 6% of our revenue came from owned brands. In other words, our own brand that wasn't a national brand like you know Kellogg's or something like that. When we sold the business, 63% of our revenues mm. came from our own brand. What changed? What changed was the media. What changed was the consumer's ability to get information on things that didn't rely on a national media with a huge budget strategy. It's the same thing going on in this business. People know Morgan Stanley because they spend tons of money advertising on television, but they also know Crescent if they open their computer and we can compete there. It's actually a really interesting analogy because my last question was going to be, what about the wealth management industry in general? Where do you think it's heading? And I think what you just shared, the notion that clients have become more savvy because they're getting information in different ways, that it's much less about the brand name and it much more about the capabilities and the model. And I think I agree with that totally. But one, as a last question, what other trends do you see developing that our listeners should be aware of? I think the disruption is going to continue as... There's 250 SPACs focused just on technology companies today, many of them on, on fintech technology companies. There are several venture capital firms that are focused totally on fintech. So, you know, look at something like FinVC. They are investing in, you know, many, many, many new technologies they're going to make things like subscription processes, reporting, uh, trading, all of those things integrate and go better. So legacy systems in big places are going to have a more difficult time moving over to those things. But independent firms that are more nimble are going to have a huge opportunity. So I think the trend is going to be more digital. We always say one of our four key pillars is going from digital competence, which is you know where we are today, to digital leadership, where we want to be, because that is 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 definitely where the puck is going. And as you look at an entrepreneur who's a, a business owner, and you know money in motion is always easier than trying to get somebody to change investment advisors. And if you look at those young entrepreneurs today who are so much money in motion. And you know, all, everything that's happening, I could argue it's going to going to increase. Those folks, their first stop is the internet, always. Their first stop is looking for something different. They're not interested in old brands. They're interested in new and emerging brands. Mm. Avi, thank you. Such wonderful insights. And I can't wait. I mean, as you said, Crescent is only in its second inning. We can't wait to hear more as it develops and matures into its fifth and sixth and seventh inning. And I hope you'll join us again. Thank you, Mindy. And, and thank you for having me. And, and we are here for you and for anybody who, who wants to talk to us. We, uh, we really believe in the great people that exist in the industry. Thank you. The world's greatest businesses were built by founders looking to find a better way. That is to fill a gap and continuously create value for the constituents they serve. As such, Firms like Crescent are winning in the race for top advisor talent. More to come from this firm and others like it, so stay tuned. I thank you for listening, and I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the articles link to browse recent topics. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. 
I can be reached by cell at 973-476-8578 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And if you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, I'd be grateful if you gave it a star rating and a review. That will let other advisors know if it's a show worth their time to listen to. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.